So I'm going to tell you today uh, about a story that actually derives from three um, great individuals in the lab. Uh, and because I usually run out of time, I want to acknowledge them first. Uh, there are two postdocs, Valerie O'Shea and Ernesto Arias Palermo, as well as a graduate student, Iris Hood. Um, and, and I'll try and point out what they did at which points. Now, in thinking about science, uh, particularly from a, a younger person's perspective, uh, th there's kind of two approaches one can take. Uh, and and what, the first approach is, you know, what I call the, the sort of boldly go approach, right? Where you're, you're striking out into fertile new ground and you're trying to be the first to plant a flag in something that, you know, no one's done before. Um, the second approach uh, you can take to science is um, more sort of the archaeological approach, where you labor and toil under a hot sun for long periods of time. Um, and I think, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of times people sort of would lump this into uh, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes <coughs> research. Um, we straddle both camps. Uh, I see the utility in both, uh, you know, uh, the, fe the federation approach as well as the Indiana Jones approach. And, and I think one of the things about the, the, the archaeology that's, that's fun, the reason you do it, and particularly why you want to go back and look for look through old things uh, is because you never know what you'll find, right? And sometimes you find uh, really important discoveries that have been lurking under our nose. Uh, and I think, as has been noted before, uh, most uh, aptly by uh, Minot, um, you know, what we learn about bacteria does indeed inform us about eukaryotes. Uh, and if you're still wondering why you should study bacteria, well, um, just think CRISPR and say no more. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about the bacterial side of things in the lab uh, today. I'm going to talk about an old system that you're all familiar with from your sophomore biochemistry, which is replication initiation in E. coli. Uh, the paradigm for this was largely established by the Kornberg, Hurwitz, and Messer groups back in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, it begins with a single origin of replication known as OREC that's recognized by an initiator protein, DNAA. Um, DNAA binds to duplex DNA binding sites in the OREC, uh, and then it forms in the presence of ATP, a large nucleoprotein complex that we now know takes the, the shape of a filament that wraps up uh, the duplex DNA. That assembly is critical for uh, the next stage in initiation in E. coli, which is to melt an AT-rich region next to those DNA binding sites. Um, DNAA catalyzes this, actually, we think, by extending the filament over into this single-stranded region. Uh, and this, the formation of this bubble is the key aspect of what DNAA does. Because unlike in eukaryotes, where ORC is basically recognizing origins and sitting there, uh, marking it and pulling in a, the helicase, the MCM helicase for loading, um, and the helicase itself generates a single-stranded DNA. In bacteria, it's the initiator that generates a single-stranded DNA. Now, that bubble, is, as you all know, is critical for the loading of the replicative helicase in E. coli. That's DNA B. Uh, and in many bacteria, they have another factor, a chaperone factor known as DNA C, uh, which serves as the loader. And it's the job of DNA C to bind to DNA B. Um, that was first discovered actually back in 1975 by, the, uh, Wick, by Wickner and Hurwitz. Uh, they form a tight complex. It's a six to six complex. And somehow, uh, DNA C is able to mobilize, to use the old Kornbergian phrase, uh, DNA B onto that origin. Uh, and that was uh, really worked out in the late 1980s again by the Kornberg lab. Now, the way DNA C does this uh, is it's also an ATPase. Right? And it turns out it's a paralog of DNAA. So they actually share some features, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute. All right, so um, if, you go, if you open up a, if you, if you ask what was the picture that Kornberg developed for helicase loading in the 1980s, uh, it looks something like this. And if you've read any of the classic papers, this would be the figure you'd see from Bramhill and Kornberg. Open complex with DNAA bound, DNA ABC, ATP, boom, helicase gets loaded. Right, a little magic there. If you go to the, about 25 years later to textbooks, uh, here's one from one of my colleagues, uh, Cynthia Wolberger. Um, not much has changed. All right. Now you could say, well, maybe that's because it's simple and and uh, you know there's there's just not much to know. But actually, it turns out that 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 is a big vacant spot because we don't know how DNA C gets DNA B onto DNA A, and we don't know why ATP is required for this reaction. All right. So um, to begin to understand this, I want to walk you through a little bit about the anatomy of replicative helicases in bacteria and the loaders. Um, so DNA B is a two-domain protein. It has an N-terminal domain that holds the, the, the 
the protein and, or forms a hexamer uh, with the protein. Uh, and, and, and then an ATPase domain, it's an ATPase domain that's the motor of the helicase that also binds DNAC. And work by several groups, Stites and Chen Labs, uh, have crystallized APO structures of DNA B um, proteins, and they all form these nice closed rings. And that, that little end terminal collar here in blue is what's, again, latching it all together. Um, the helicase loader DNAC is also a two-domain protein. It's pretty simple. At its end terminus uh, is a little bit of a scaffolding that binds to DNA B. Uh, and at its C terminus is a AAA plus ATPase domain. And several years ago, a student in the lab, Melissa Mott, um, determined the structure of that ATPase domain and found that it formed spiral oligomers. And so this is kind of where the field stood, really up to 2008, okay? So not, mu not a huge amount of progress at this point. Um, so what we needed to do is begin to understand the loading reaction was figure out what DNAC was actually doing to DNAB. So to do that, we turned to electron microscopy, and I'm almost embarrassed to show this resolution of a, micro, of a reconstruction these days, but this was done before the direct electron detectors. It's negative stain, uh, and it's perfectly reasonable resolution for, the, for it to answer what we wanted to answer. So this is the work now of Ernesto uh, and Valerie. Uh, it's about 25 angstrom negative stain reconstruction of the two, uh, 480 kilodalton DNA BC complex. Um, what we could see is that that complex forms a sort of three-tier uh, assembly. There's six subunits of DNA C. There's six subunits of DNA B. And the important thing about this that was gratifying to us was that that little helical uh, spiral of DNA C ATPase domains that Melissa had, had crystallized fits beautifully into that, this complex, right? So that spiral assembly, uh, which is uh, linked together by ATP molecules that are bound between subunits of DNAC, is exactly what you see um, in this, in this uh, binary complex. So now we're in a position to ask, what's DNAC doing to DNAB? Um, and if we look down on a DNAB ring from a top, this would be the APO structure I showed you earlier. This one happens to be from the Stites lab. And we morph it into the, the state of the DNAB ring that we see in our, in our um, EM reconstruction. Uh, you can see there's a very large on-block conformational rearrangement, which cracks uh, the, the DNAB ring, um, provided it's about a 15 angstrom gap or so uh, between the subunits. Um, and this pretty much definitively shows that DNAB is, a, is to use the words of, of Mike O'Donnell from many years ago, a, a ring breaker, right? It's cracking the DNAB ring open to uh, allow entry of single-stranded DNA into the hole where translocation is going to take place. Okay, so that's all published. Um, it serves as a preamble for you know, the next set of questions or assumptions, which is that, well, uh, if DNA sees an ATPase and it's cracking the ring, um, that ATP must be being channeled some way into doing work, right? It's doing the work of opening up that ring. And that would be a logical first assumption. Um, but as it turns out, uh, there's been a bit of a, a debate about this. So many years ago, Kunin's group uh, established, before any structural work was done, that DNAC was a AAA plus ATPase. Um, this is a very special family of ATPases for those of us who study ORCs and MCMs and whatnot. We're well familiar with it, but for those of you who are not, uh, AAA ATPases have a set of conserved amino acid sequence motifs that are involved in nucleotide binding and hydrolysis. And they, this, these, binding, these, these motifs have very specific effects a lot of times on enzyme function, right? So if you can't bind, you often get one set of a mutant that does one thing. If you can't hydrolyze, you get a mutant that does a different thing, et cetera. Um, so those were all there, and, our, and the crystal structure Melissa sh solved, it looked like all those motifs were in place. Uh, shortly after that paper by Kunin's group, Mike O'Donnell's group published a beautiful paper, which has really inspired a lot of our work in this field, showing uh, very clearly that DNAC was an ATPase. All right, so, okay, end of story. Then about six years, eight years later, two different groups actually uh, looked at this through different methods, and they could not detect any ATPase activity. All right, so, um, so what's going on? Well, uh, moreover, there were some other puzzles in that paper of Mike's. Uh, one puzzle was that uh, it turns out that DNAC needs ATP um, to load DNA B onto Ori C that's been processed by DNA A. But Mike's group also showed that ATP is not required to get DNA B onto a single-stranded M13 circle. So why the difference, right? Why should, it be, why should ATP be required for ORIC loading onto a bubble, but not required for loading onto a large single-stranded region? Okay, so what's going on? 
Um, so first off, we wanted to go back and investigate, is DNAC really an ATPase? As I mentioned, the crystal structure we had solved, if I zoom in on one of those active sites, we see all the constellation of conserved AAA ATPase motifs and all those sort of right organizations. It certainly looks like a functional active site. Uh, and largely following uh, the work of Mike's and with a few twists, uh, we were able to show that if we you know, look at DNAC by itself or DNAC bound to various uh, substituents, single-stranded DNA, DNAB, um, you use a mutant of DNAB that doesn't have ATPase activity. Uh, we don't see anything, but if you mix both single-stranded DNA and DNAB, you get a nice robust ATPase signal. So it does indeed possess an ATPase. You need both the helicase, though, and single-stranded DNA to see that helicase activity. Um, for those of aficionados who are interested, it follows nice Michaelis metan kinetics. It's about three molecules of ATP per DNAC per minute. <laughs> Okay, so that's fine. It's an ATPase. I think that sort of hopefully settles that debate. Um, but there was a question that came up that still gets to how, why is it you don't need ATP to load DNA B onto an M13 uh, single-stranded DNA circle? Um, and in looking at the structure, uh, and also, real, you know, re again, recognizing which part of DNAC bound to the helicase, uh, we recognize that it's not the ATPase domains that engage the, the helicase ring, it's these N-terminal domains. And there's no structure yet to determine for these N-terminal domains. There's these sort of gray stalks that are connecting the, the DNAC and, and DNAB rings together. Um, but it led us to do an experiment uh, where we basically said, okay, well, if you don't need ATP for DNAC to load DNAB onto M13, uh, maybe you don't need uh, the ATPase domains at all. So we, uh, again, took a sort of a classic experiment. We take an M13 circle with a, a primer annealed DNAB alone, which is, again, is closed ring, doesn't really touch this. But if you now just titrate in the N-terminal domain, you get a very nice uh, loading uh, signal, which is evinced by this, uh, the, actually, it's a loading and translocation or unwinding signal, right? So you can see the product being formed. So the DNAC N-terminal domain by itself is sufficient to tickle that DNAB ring open allow it to bind to DNA, and then DNA B can go do whatever it needs to do. All right. Um, but then why do you have the ATPase domains? And I think the answer to that comes from this experiment where we compared uh, how well the N-terminal domain itself performs versus the ATPase domains. And what I think you can see is that when DNA C can bind ATP, uh, the reaction is simply much more efficient. Right? So um, that's really the role of what's going on, is that those ATP histamines are improving the efficiency of loading reaction. And so then the question is, well, how are they doing that? What, what specifically is going on that would allow uh, ATP to improve that? So we started to dissect what's going on with the ATPA cycle in more detail. Um, again, here are these various uh, classic AT AAA ATPase motifs. Um, uh, in addition, there's a, there's a region specific to helicase loaders and initiators, which form a, a, a single um, a small grouping within the AAA plus fruit superfamily um, called the initiator loader clade. Uh, it's called the initiator specific motif. It's a little extra alpha helix. This uh, region corresponds to the pore uh, of these, of these um, assemblies, right? So this is looking down now on this DNAC uh, helix, and I've colored that little ISM there. And what we noticed when looking at this was that there was a conserved uh, lysine or arginine that's sitting in that, that poor region, right, in addition to these other known motifs. And we were, when we were looking at sequence alignments um, of this arginine finger region, this is a region that basically allows uh, one subunit to talk to another subunit's active site. Uh, it turns out there's another invariant arginine that's sitting right by there. So we were wondering, well, maybe this is a, a, a potential second arginine finger. All right, so I, I won't go through all of the data. I'm just going to try and summarize it in the interest of time. Uh, basically, we first looked at the effect of making these various mutations on DNAC's ATPase activity. This is all measured with single-stranded DNA and with the DNA B mutant again, because um, otherwise you don't see it. Um, most of these uh, mutations do about what you would expect. You knock them down. You don't see much ATPase activity. That's not too interesting. Uh, the, one of the interesting ones was this lysine on this initiator-specific motif that we knocked out, uh, because when we knock it out, the ATPS activity disappears, 
right? Um, and this amino acid is more than 20 angstroms from the active site where hydrolysis is going on, uh, and it tells us that this lysine is basically a, a sensor for DNA. So we know that single-stranded DNA is going to bind in that pore. Um, we don't have a crystal structure or EM structure of that, but we, we now predict that that's going to make a key interaction with DNA. Um, the other was this other arginine, uh, this arginine finger 2. Um, when we actually mutated it, the ATPase activity of the loader went up rather than down. And moreover, it turned out to be active even without single-stranded DNA. So this tells us that this amino acid is a, is a coupler, uh, and its role is to repress the ATPase activity of DNA-C until single-stranded DNA is bound. Right? So we're beginning to see some real sophistication in how this little uh, ATPase cassette has evolved, and that it's got various sensors for detecting when the right bits and, and bobs are, are bound so it can do its job. All right. Um, so the next thing that we looked at is a rather peculiar and I think somewhat unappreciated feature of um, the, re the bacterial replicative helicase. Um, and that came out of this study, which was uh, a study we did as a control, but it turned out to be um, very confusing till we, till we worked that out. Uh, basically, it's a simple fork unwinding assay. Uh, you add DNA B to this fork, DNA B threads onto the 5 prime end. It's a 5 to 3 prime translocase. You have a fluorophore and a quench, and so when it unwinds in the presence of ATP, you should get a fluorescent signal. Now, you would predict that DNA B should just be able to do this fine, right, on its own, because it just threads on and moves. Um, and, and people had, had done that experiment and you do indeed see unwinding, but they always used a lot of DNA B, like a hundredfold molar excess to get this to work, or they always had DNA C around. That was a little puzzling to us, so we were investigating this, and it turns out DNA B by itself doesn't touch this substrate at all. But if you add DNA C, or just the N-terminal domain of DNA C, now it switches on. And so this had told us at the time that the DNA C isn't just a ring opener. It's remodeling DNA B in some way to switch on its what's otherwise a repressed helicase activity, right? And so again, um, DNA B is naturally inactive, and the loader, the act of loading, actually turns it on. And that's somewhat reminiscent, although very different, of course, than the MCMs, which are loaded in an inactive state and then later activated um, in S phase through phosphorylation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's analogous process, totally different mechanism. Okay, but what are these mutants doing to this activation event? All right, so first, let's first look at this uh, additional um, arginine finger this, um, that we see. So if we make a mutation in it uh, and we ask d what's the effect of that mutation on this DNA B unwinding activation by the loader, uh, it's about wild types, maybe down 50%. Uh, that phenocopy is a Walker A mutant. So the Walker A mutants don't bind ATP. Uh, that's been shown quite definitively by Mike O'Donnell for DNA-C. Um, so a Walker A mutant likewise stimulates DNA-B for unwinding pretty well. If you make other hydrolysis defective mutants, okay, so blocking ATP binding still allows fork unwinding or activation. If you make other ATPase mutants, though, you get very different effects, <clears throat> particularly uh, Walker Bs, um, this, ice, this uh, ISM lysine, this lysine sensor, you knock those down. Now you don't see any activity. You don't see any unwinding by the helicase in the presence of DNA-C. So what this is telling us is that if you block hydrolysis, you repress DNA-B unwinding. And that explains a very old observation by the Kornberg group, which is they found if you just added lots of ATP or if you added a non-hydrolyzable ATP analog, you would never see uh, unwinding um, by the helicase uh, in the presence of DNA-C in, in, in an OEC-dependent loading reaction. Okay, so how is this working? Why is this working the way it is? Well, to, to understand this, uh, we turn to a loading reaction that was again developed by Mike's group. Um, it's a pretty simple loading reaction. I've already described it a little bit. It's M13 single-stranded DNA. It's DNA-C and DNA-B. What you do is you mix these together. Um, uh, with ATP, you do a short incubation, and then you put them over a gel filtration column, and then the gel filtration column is equilibrated either with no nucleotide, with ADP, or with ATP in the running buffer. Uh, and then you run fractions by SDS page, and you ask, where's the helicase with respect to the DNA? All right. Um, so uh, we're doing this now just by silver staining, uh, so we're able to track all the substituents, DNA, uh, et cetera, so DNA B, DNA C, BSA is in there, uh, just just 
because you always put BSA in everything, I guess. I mean, that's usually the way it works. Uh, what you can see is that DNA B uh, quantitatively associates with single-stranded DNA. So, so now, in this case, we have ADP, or no nucleotide in the running buffer. So we give the helicase loader um, some ATP. It mobilizes DNA B under the DNA. Uh, it, that, that DNA B associates. What's interesting, though, is that the DNA C also remains associated with the DNA B. And that's interesting because, if you'll recall, um, in the unwinding reaction, right, uh, DNA C is, DNA B is, un if, you, if you have a, a primer annealed to this single stranded DNA, DNA C is unwind DNA B is unwinding it. The DNA C is still bound. Uh, and this is, we know it's loaded because it's salt resistant. Now, if we add ATP in the running buffer, we see something very different. We don't see any DNA B associated with the M13, and the DNA BC complex still uh, stays associated. So when ATP is present, you're not getting a stable association. It, in fact, what we think is going on is that it's pr the reverse reaction is happening. You're getting an unloading reaction, basically, as the DNA partitions itself away in the gel filtration column from the helicase loader, they just, they just come apart. And so what this is telling us is that ATP hydrolysis by DNA-C is necessary to allow ring closure and that that's important for getting stable binding of the helicase to, um, to the DNA. Okay, so my time's about up, or my time is up, so I just want to go back to this textbook view. Um, I think we can say it's not nearly this simple. Uh, there are many, many intermediates. We know we have closed DNA-B rings. We know that DNA-C... Uh, on its own is sufficient to bind and tickle those rings open, but that's not very efficient. When you have it, but that is enough to activate the helicase. Um, if you have ATP around, you, uh, the DNA C undergoes a monomer multimer assembly um, uh, event on the helicase itself, which opens a, a stabilizes an open ring state. Uh, that allows the helicase to bind single-stranded DNA well, at which point ATP can get hydrolyzed. The DNA C monomerizes, but the DNA C can still stay attached to DNA B. Right? But that allows the DNA B ring to close, uh, and at some point DNA C has to come off and you get unwinding. There's many questions about this process. Um, oh, I should also mention we have some tr new triggers and sensors we've identified, including this second arch finger and this light, uh, extra lysine. There's many questions about this process still. Um, in fact, the work opens up more questions in it than, than it answers. Um, one is how does DNA B inhibit the ATPase of DNA C and this extra arginine finger, even though the active site looks like it's well formed? Um, how does single stranded DNA, in turn, tickle the DNA C in some way so that now the ATPase activity turns on? Um, and this is actually going to be interesting, I think, because of the shared motifs that DNA-C shares with ORC and CDC-6 and some of these other things. I think what we learn here is going to inform us a little bit about ORC CDC-6 function. I didn't mention, but it, it turns out DNA-C uh, undergoes an auto-activation event. It's inactive until it binds the helicase. We'd like to understand that. This DNA-C ejection process is interesting because it turns out that's covered by, that's done by primase. We don't understand that. Um, and we now think that actually DNA-C may be able to track with DNA-B at some limited capacity until primase binds, and we'd like to test that. And we're using a combination of structural, biochemical, and we're even getting into single molecule approaches for that. All right, so again, I'll just acknowledge the people who did the work, uh, and I'd very much like to thank Evan Ogalas, who uh, helped us with the microscopy in this uh, process, as well as the NIGMS, which supported it. Thanks. <laughs>